So this is our seven, seven, nine, five, week 12 post-qualifying exams where everyone did great on day two <laughs> quals and where I'm grading day one quals maybe during the rest of this week. But we don't grade our own students. We grade people who are not our students, typically. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's been passed around. I can say it's been passed around today or yesterday. So I printed those off and we'll be reading those. So uh, I do you think the practice quals helped? You are? Yeah, it definitely made me realize that time goes by so fast. Right, because it has a timer in them. Any other comments about quals before I turn it over to Susie and to Tiffany? Um, I did thank uh, Sumi, she's not here, but I did thank her a lot. She gave us the idea about preparing your templates ahead of time. Those templates saved me, <laughs> both of them. So yeah, that was wonderful. Who had the template idea? It wasn't me. It was someone else. Uh, no, I said Sumi. Sumi, Sumi yeah. right. Yeah. Sumi had that. So you'll have I to thank I second that. I, shot, I mean, that was hugely helpful to, mm -hmm. to have that advice. <laughs> <laughs> I once had a deep discussion in one of my classes about the templication, <laughs> templication of education. <laughs> Templ templication. I can't even pronounce it now. I can I can hear it in my brain, but um, templatization. Yeah, templatization Is that the one? of education. <laughs> there you go. You can have my job, and I'll take yours. Um, <laughs> templatization. So you can, you can. Maybe there should be an ISD course on creating templates, prototypes, models, and frameworks. You know, job aids and all that kind of stuff. That's what's called scaffolded learning, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I think you've got your little ones there, so you're muted, Megan, right? So yeah. um, I think that part oh, no, I was just saying I would built take into production class because I remember some of the assignments we did in production class had to do with preparing a job aid and templates for some things. Yeah. So, yeah. so you'll hear more of that from Susie and, and from Tiffany. And I had the privilege of seeing their slides ahead of time. So I know that they're quite engaging and enriching. And I don't know which one of you would like to jump in first, but uh, both of them were IU students starting in the late 2000s. And I think Susie graduated maybe 2011. Is that That's about good, right? yes. <laughs> okay. Wow. And, and Tiffany was about six years after that or so, or yeah. five years, five years <laughs> after that or so. Yeah. She was gone, but came back to defend. So, you know, one of those people that we don't re we don't recommend doing that because sometimes people don't finish. But in her case, it worked out grand. Well, I was gone, but I just kind of was a little hermit on campus. I was over in the UITS building, so oh, I didn't right. leave town. I did not right. leave. So you were like Mena and like Dave and like Merve. You worked in UITS as a kind of a postdoc or a grad assistant. So in a great job working for our current Dean, Stacey Maroney and others. So um, I, I think I saw Tiffany's slides more recently and I know there's some good actors in her slides um, <laughs> or actor memes. <laughs> and since I think we should get started with memes, I think Tiffany should get us rolling tonight if that's okay. Sure, absolutely. And so, um... So, so Tiffany's at Kennesaw State, where mm -hmm. they have like 10 jobs in ISD waiting for all of you to apply. And, and <laughs> she's going up for tenure early this year, I believe. And so she's, she's an accomplished writer and instructor. And because of that, she's able to go up early. That's just not normal. I mean, I've been at this for more than three decades. And I maybe could count on one hand or less the people that I know that have gone up early. Uh, so it's, it's it's big big time, and uh, I hope it's smooth sailing. Um, and Susie got the outstanding early career alumni award from the School of Ed last year. So she's also done great things early in her career at the University of Houston. She's a clinical associate professor and the first clinical professor at Houston to become the president of the faculty senate. <laughs> so she, I, I will hope that both. Um, Tiffany 
And Susie could throw in a little bit of, about what it's like going up early for tenure, about what it's like being in charge of the faculty senate. So I think that's about there's some valuable lessons um, for for us, for me too. Uh, so anything you want to throw in in that that regard, um, that would be great. Uh, Tiffany, why don't you uh, fill in the gaps of what I I didn't really say a whole lot of, of your interest areas. Oh, sure. You know, and what you've published in, what are some of the areas that, that you've published in? And Tiffany's from South Bend, Indiana. So she is a Hoosier and she went to school with Mayor Pete uh, when she was a little kid, <laughs> a tiny little top. <laughs> right. Yes. Here, I need to turn this off. I have. I am multi, I have my kids at home are kind of free, free range. Um, free range. Free range right now, you know, you set them up with food, water, drinks, provisions, and you hope that they're, that they're okay. Um, so just a little briefly about me in terms of my research, as um, Dr. Bonk mentioned, I work for Dr. Maroney, who was in charge of the Mosaic Initiative. Um, at IU, which put active learning spaces across all campuses and had a faculty development program, which is something to be aware of as you transition into faculty positions, what the Centers for Excellence of Teaching and Learning have for you, because it may come with funding and support um, and also research opportunities. And so essentially, I served in a postdoc role. It was a graduate research role, but Dr. Maroney is uh, very busy. So it felt more like a postdoc and did collaborative research across disciplines, political science, um, English, I think interior design. I was able to do research with other faculty members. So it was a great way to kick off into a tenure track position. So I think that's one of the things, that, you know, in terms of first tip of advice, and I'll have my slide link in the chat. So if you're there, um, you can pop in there to see my slides. Um, I would just say it's great to kind of leave with works in progress that aren't yet published because as soon as you go into your position and those start to get published then they're recognized at your new institution um, anything that you i mean it's good to show that you have the ability to publish that's why you have a publication or two coming in advance but really having things that can hit after you're at the institution is really kind of the secret sauce um, that will help you towards tenure so um is that okay for a like a little I don't want to talk too much about my my right. research, but yeah, so, I can. So we have eight students in this class plus okay. Karen. Karen is a getting her doctorate at Houston. We have seven at Indiana who are EDD students and one who's right. PhD. So right. most may not have a tenure track yeah. position in mind, are already employed full time, but still they're probably in the back of their head thinking about it. Right. Uh, nonetheless, well, what it right. would be like. Yeah. At Kennesaw, I mainly teach EDD students. And so the presentation I'm about to give was geared for EDD students in mind. And if you're a doctoral student, a PhD student, you can also benefit from this. So I think that keep in mind that what I've when I've composed here is really for EDD students, because we do ours fully, um, our EDD program is fully online. And so all classes, I have a doc seminar myself that I teach. Um, with EDD and advanced EDS students together. So we kind of have a, a, an in-between degree between the masters and our EDD program. So yeah, you, you should find this really helpful. It's really meant to, to build community. That's mainly what I'm gonna be talking about tonight is community and writing. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Is that okay? I'm gonna share my screen. So you got your master's and doctorate your PhD at IU and your undergraduate at IU too or somewhere else? Who, me? Yeah, I think you were in oh. Texas, weren't you, for a while? I was in Texas, but that's where I did my K-12 teaching. Okay. So I actually have my undergraduate and graduate degrees um, are from the University of Notre Dame in South Bend. Mm. Um, and that's where I grew up. So I, I always joke like college was closer than my high school because the college campus was seven minutes away and my high school was 10. I had to drive past it to go to high school. So yeah, it was, I felt like I was like staying home, you know? And so I studied abroad for a year, which I thought was really important to me and, and who I am as a, as a scholar working abroad. Um, yeah, so I was in Texas. I went to Texas after I had graduated with my master's and I taught in K-12 for um, five years. So I taught 
fifth grade self-contained and then middle and high school art and design. So I have a background in design and that's actually where I situate my research is how do we teach design at, um, in secondary learning environments? And I kind of start there because we have it established at the college university level. So I'm working my way back. It's like, if we can show this at the secondary, we can more likely shift towards elementary. So I'd have to kind of prove my case a little bit backwards in some regards. So, um, what, so why don't you share your screens? Yeah. And also let us know, um, was that international study, was that um, the other country you were in, was that Texas or the, where was that? Oh, I was in France when I was an undergrad. Okay. <laughs> I lived in a town called Angers. <laughs> and I'm sorry if I didn't say, it. I, you know, the time change is messing me up. Um, so if I say anything that doesn't sound right, feel free to like pause and clarify. <laughs> But I know you're also saying he's he's nabbing at Texas there, saying it's different. <laughs> they like to think of themselves as their own country, which is yeah. true. Which is true. But they are a unique, they are a unique state among states, as Susie will attest to. Yeah. Congratulations on the Astros, by the way, Susie. Though I'm in Atlanta, so I'm a Braves fan. And they didn't make it. Pass and CLS, but that's okay. That's neither here nor there. We'll get them next year. Okay, so here is, I'd love for everyone to open this slide deck, bit.ly backslash tips. You have to have the capital F, um, A22. And so that way you can have access. You can just bookmark this and then you can come back to the resources and it's gonna be interactive. So if you have a computer or a desktop open, I would love, we're gonna actually do something together. I'm gonna make you do a learning activity, okay? And one of the things I try to bring in, I'm the youngest of three children, and the youngest child usually has to interject some humor because usually everyone's too serious. So um, I think that's in the slide deck, I, I try to keep it light when we talk about writing. So writing, I have, I have some feelings about writing. I, some days it's easy, some days it's like, ah, <laughs> I don't know where to start. So. Um, if you find yourself wailing awkwardly, that's okay. And sometimes our goals, particularly in the dissertation or prospectus or the proposal writing phase, you're like, I'm gonna get it done this month. I'm gonna write my whole proposal and defend this month. And there's sometimes, you, you know, you think back, you're like, I didn't necessarily achieve the goal that I set out to achieve um, and for various reasons, right? So, and by the way, this is- uh, So don't, 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 don't tell them. In the I chat window, anyone. in the chat window, is <laughs> this, uh, what actor is this? Let's what put it that way. What actor is this? What actor is this? There's we have, we have disagreements. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So I think it's Kevin Bacon. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> thinks it's, it's Mark Wahlberg. Mm -hmm. And who said Mark Damon? I thought, you know, maybe. So Tiffany thinks it's Mark Damon. I still Matt think it's Matt, Matt Damon. Damon but yeah, Megan. Susie is like, it's definitely Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> we can we can discuss this for a minute. No oh, one wait, that, that's Mark and Mark. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, wait, is it? No way. There is. Did I mess that up? I can, I've never thought they looked alike ever. When people are like, they look so much alike. I've never thought that. And now watch, I just messed it up. <laughs> it's almost like Kevin Bacon now, really. Come on now. <laughs> no. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> all right, all right. Okay. Next one. I got to close my chat box for it to work. Okay. So what I think is having the right mindset will help you so much going forward wherever you are, wherever you are in the process. Um, you, you, don't, you don't have to be in a new place to do a fresh start, but you just need kind of the right mindset, I think, for this. And so what I wanna bring to your attention, and you may already know all about these resources, but if there's one, just one thing that you can gain from this, I feel like this was a success having me um, drop in on, on this class tonight. And thank you for inviting me, Dr. Bond. You didn't have to do that. Oh, um, that was oh. very sweet. No, it's very sweet to have you. <laughs> oh, I'm, pleasure to be here. Pleasure to be here. So some of you may be aware, but back in the day when I was at IU, they joined the National Center for Faculty Diversity and Development. And you have a free membership. So if you haven't yet gone there, if you click, this should take you to 
facultydiversity.org where you can sign in with your IU account. Okay, so you will create an account with IU and they have, and this applies to EDD or PhD students, they have a doctoral success curriculum, it's 12 weeks. And I used this one semester when I was working on my proposal and putting all my RB stuff through and I found it to be really beneficial. Um, they also have some core curricular webinars and recordings and I'll talk to you about that because some of them are really good as well as a 14 day writing challenge. So we'll talk about a little bit more of these um, not too far in depth, but this is a picture of what the week one orientation is like. So it kind of, Carrie Ann, she's the founder of this program, does these short videos. She's She was teaching at a community college and had a five, uh, five classes a semester and she got through the end of a year and hadn't written a page of her dissertation and she knew there had to be a better way because she's a great scholar. And so what she was like, there's just not enough really support sometimes for full time. And a lot of doctoral students that are EDD, at least at KSU, work full time. So if you work full time and you're also getting your doctoral degree, you need to be very efficient with your time. And so these are worth your time and energy to go through. She also has within her program, this is all free, no cost to you. There is accountability check-ins with people across the United States. And so I have a picture here from October 22, but there's one for November 2022, where you're just kind of checking in with other people as an accountability measure. So I think this is great one way to pop in um, and see how other people are doing. Their core curriculum is actually really fabulous. The one, there's one coming up in two days. You can take it, it's free. How to manage stress, rejection, and haters in your midst. <laughs> and I think everyone could use, uh, I mean, I think everyone, academics are used to rejection, whether we like it or not. We all benefit from, I think, hearing in a constructive way how our work could be better but um these are just some examples of and they record them so if you sign up can't make it like you're like there's no way i can be there at two o'clock i work at two o'clock you sign up and then you can get a, re a link to the recording and it's something to take advantage of okay um they also have there's 14 days that they do this every semester of their boot camp um writing check-ins so you'll set your writing goals you reflect on did you meet your goals for today or not and they have these questions the setup of questions that you answer and i've created it for you and we're gonna go there now because she the way that she has this company right she charges faculty thousands of dollars i think it's about three thousand dollars right now to participate in this accountability setup that you see in front of us she usually has institutions pay for it so I took that same concept and put it in a Google spreadsheet because <laughs> really it's just questions and all people have to do is show up. The only difference is you can't get your little star, but you can paste in a star if you hit, you know, if you need your little star because everyone knows those are really, those are good reinforcements, right? Having a little star. So here is your boot camp. And what I've done is I've created the same questions that Carrie Ann asks. What are your goals for today? How many minutes did you spend on writing or research today? Did you meet your goals today? Why or why not? It's important to go through these questions because these are the ones you answer every single day. What was the internal challenge you faced? Maybe like today's in an election night. Maybe you're curious, is Georgia, which way is Georgia gonna go? We're going for Herschel Walker, we're we gonna go for Raphael Warnock. All right, so I'm curious how it's gonna end up. Um, but what was your big external challenge today? My son was home because he had no school because it's a voting day. Um, what progress did you make towards personal goals? We should stay healthy. Did you run? Dr. Bong has been running every day since the pandemic, March 2019, 2020. 21, 21, March 21. 21. So how many, How what day are we on? 962. There we go. Okay, so probably his personal goal every day is to run at least two miles. Um, what can you be proud of today? You're here, you made it to class. So I think you should all be proud of that. You took time out of your day. And then what are your goals for tomorrow? So parking on that downhill slope, what am I gonna try to accomplish tomorrow? When I do my goals, if you go back, you'll see I go across kind of, because I'm in a faculty role, I say teaching, what's my goal? 
Research, what's my goal? Service, what's my goal? What's the other? Because sometimes I don't have a service. Service is just 20% of my load, but it's okay for you to say, hey, what's my job? What do I have to do for my job today? So it doesn't have to be just research. I think it's better to actually say, what are my goals for the day broadly, but include the writing piece with it. So here's where we're gonna go to jump in. This is, I'll copy and paste this link as well, but if you're in the slide deck, this hyperlink works. So I want everyone to come here and you're going to write, you will find a box. If someone's in that box, then that means it's taken, but you can go to one of the boxes towards the end and just type in your name. So you write Tiffany or whatever your name is. Um, and then you'll say, what are your goals for today? So we're gonna actually, I want you to take, if it's okay, Dr. Bonk, to take three minutes because I want them to practice. Yeah, yeah filling this out because I'm not joking. I actually do this. I've set it up for you. If you look at the tabs, I have set this up through fe February 10th for you every weekday. And you might say, why weekdays? Um, so everyone pop in here. I see your little faces. I'm going to refresh, but I hope everyone's kind of picking a box. So go to where your name is, type your name in. I need my anonymous anteater and other people to type your name in. And go I ahead and my I can't pardon? type my name. I can't type my name in. It says view. It. it says view only. Oh, thank you. You betcha. Done. You now can edit. I was like, don't be shy. <laughs> Hi. Now we go. Thank you. Now you're good. Okay. So now you all can type. But go ahead and actually write what your goal was for today. One of my goals today was I'm gonna go ahead and delete my name so you can pop in there because I don't need to be. And you can invite friends. But I think that if you just keep showing up, what will happen is some people stick with it. Some people um, do it for a little while and then leave. But usually there'll be a couple and you, it's, you're not going to maybe check in all day if you're traveling. I mean, traveling, traveling, man, Dr. Bunk on a travel day tomorrow, tomorrow, you're traveling tomorrow. Yeah. So he's probably not going to be able to check in on this spreadsheet um and that's okay you're not always going to be able to check in um but you can come back the next day but i think what makes it so powerful is you do it asynchronously so you don't all have to be asynchronous together and you're all in this degree together right ben has been working with megan and shannon and rachel um you can all continue to work together and i've been working with her name's stephanie win who is in higher ed. Have you met her, Dr. Bonk? She said you spoke to her class once. She's in higher ed. Yeah, I think so, yeah. She's awesome. She has mm. been, her dissertation focuses on um, Asian American educational, um, Asian American education and higher ed, kind of like she's was at Wisconsin, actually, and um, doing site, kind of a historical document analysis. Like she's gonna have, an amazing dissertation when she's done. She's doing really, really, really pivotal work. Um, and I would just happen to be in a writing with group with her in through a CEDL program, right? The dissertation success group through CEDL on campus. Um, I write with her and a guy named Eddie who got his PhD at IU in history. And he's a tenure track professor at University of Tennessee Chattanooga. We have been doing this spreadsheet for three years, maybe four. No, actually more than that. I'm going to go with, because I'm entering my fifth year, four to five years. We do this every weekday. Summers, we take the holidays off kind of, you know, we check in usually during the academic term. But what's really great is that if you finished, like Susie's kind of, I feel like you can write more. I know you're tired, Ben, but say, is it the time change? Is it, um, and Megan, I love your honesty to be like, I haven't done any, I haven't finished my project reflection paper. So you can write comments to each other at the end. So I'm going to pop into Megan and I'm going to say, I really appreciate your honesty, Megan. And I hope you're able to touch it tomorrow for five minutes. You know, I always say, and then I put my name. 
So if you have a small group of people, you can go around and give each other encouragement and you learn a lot about each other. Maybe someone's parent is sick. Maybe someone's kid vomited in their car, right? Derailed the day. Like it's okay to have, I think if you go back to my slide deck, you can take, I know we're practicing with it right now, but this is just day one. And actually we wrote on the wrong day. Ha ha. <laughs> I'll be sure we wrote on, we wrote on Monday, November 7th, but technically we should have done the two, the tab at the bottom should have been um, November 8th instead of the 7th, that's totally fine. Um, it's okay. It's okay, I feel badly now. But you'll jump in probably on the 11th tomorrow. And like I said, if we have this kind of turnout keep coming, but keep showing up, keep showing up because there's likely two or three or four of you that will keep showing up and weekdays are important. I know you want to be a weekend warrior, but just touching your stuff a little bit a day will keep your momentum going in this program and finishing on time. But I don't know, Dr. Bunk, how, Ooh. how like if your EDDs finish super fast or like right on time or some, there's variation if it's like a bell curve of. This class is done with every assignment two weeks ahead of time. <gasps> Stop it. <laughs> oh, yeah. God. That's they're really, really good. Just, they're really good. Yeah, you guys are great. Susie, you wrote for 360 minutes today? That's incredible. Yeah. Wow. And that's the main thing I did today. Really needed to get that oh my manuscript done. Oh my goodness. 360 is so impressive. So I want you to go encourage everyone. Go give. Go give someone, at least one person on the chart, write a comment to them. Because it feels good reaffirming, like you got to read that person's column. But I would say, you know, like even if it's like, I'm glad you're here, Shannon. But that affirmation really counts. So, and don't forget our people at the end because <laughs> it gets we want to make sure everyone feels included so what do you think of this this again carrie ann charges essentially three thousand dollars for this because it's the community she's selling yes there's a tool but it's the community and you already have a built-in community and being in affiliated with dr bonk in this class hmm. so that's why i just want to encourage you to keep going so Bookmark this, use that little tool. If you use Chrome, you can you can bookmark it, save it in your folder. Pick whatever folder you want. I'm gonna remove my bookmark there, but this is for you. This is a gift. It's like Oprah and you get a writing log and you get a writing log and you get a writing log. And it's okay to just say zero, you know, if but at least you're checking in and you're reminding and supporting each other in community. Sabahat, ETNS draft. So big, that's an SSCI journal. That's not me. This is another SG. <laughs> oh, okay. Which S? Oh, Susie. Susie. Okay. Susie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have Susie. two SGs that's here. Awesome. Today. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So like, yeah, I think this is why it's just, it's a good, all right. I just, I like to spend time on this because if I skirt over this, it doesn't become meaningful to you. And I want it to be meaningful to you. Because they're your friends who you'll stay with for a while. So you can stay here. I'm going to keep going. Yep. So because, again, I'm not the only person. I just want to bring attention to a couple other additional support groups. Because writing in the EDD program can be kind of isolating once you get to the dissertation phase. There is a grad write Slack. And that's on Twitter. As we know, Twitter is kind of undergoing a few changes this week and last <laughs> week. Um, so I don't know how long, what it's going to be like, but to be a part of it, and if you're familiar with Slack, you have to just request an email to join. And it's a really good, if you're a Slack user, can you raise your hand in Zoom if you're like, if you use Slack or if you're a Slack efficient, you know, some of you may like Slack. If I don't see a hand raised, you may not want to do it. Again, you don't have to do all the things I share. But Slack is just meant to be a tool. It's kind of like Microsoft Team asynchronous threads so that you don't use email. And you can communicate essentially in 
a space um, that is pretty, pretty awesome. I think I have, a, I don't know if I have a picture of it, but there's also, I want to let you know, <laughs> there's an online study room. So it's 24 um, seven and usually it's unmoderated and kind of an unstructured space. And you kind of go through an Eventbrite. Now they haven't, you can go to at PhD forum. So these links work. So if you click this link, it'll take you to their, the PhD forum.com and then also the Twitter community. So it's just meant again, I know it says PhD, but it's really like ADD people you are fine use these resources this is for you you're also in doctoral programs and i don't treat I, I'm, I'm gonna be very honest i treat my edd students no different than i would treat a phd student um i just always say your work is advancing practice but i also try to have them advance theory of course as well um and this is some old school tips this is old school texting a friend in the program and saying hey do you want to write with me for 25 minutes you know 10 minutes from now um and that's what I did after, particularly if you have kids and they go to bed and you've got that nine to nine thirty window and you're tired, but you're not ready for bed and you can knock out something. That's a great time to touch in with a friend. And I did that with a friend of mine. Um, you can also, and this is another thing that I used to do is I used to hand off my kids on a Saturday morning. And I was like, I'm going to a coffee shop from nine to 1130 or nine to noon, and I will be back home. And I just took that time to kind of get it done with friends. So we would convene at a place and kind of work together. Um, so just be sure to set boundaries on chatting because you know your three hours could be consumed by um, more than one person. I really recommend following on Twitter, write that PhD because they give really good resources. So they may say like, what's your broad research goal and what are some review questions um when looking at this type of goal in your writing so they have this is another visual let me go forward here how can the issue of x be better addressed this is a mind map of questions you could do for a lit review so these are the kind of resources shared on that twitter resource for that at write that PhD. i love these kind of resources i always just it helps me think about my own work and different ways to think about my work so consider that one as well Raul Paccio, he is an academic in Mexico. He is he has a blog that he also shares out tips on um, in Twitter. And he's, I think he just talks about academic writing in general. And so he's just super supportive, I think, of doctoral students broadly, knowing that these kind of um, you you would benefit from some of these strategies. So I really enjoy reading um, his tweets. Now, maybe focusing is when you do have that free time, it's kind of focusing can be a chap. I've, obviously, you are aware of these tools. Um, I love to promote the forest app, in part because there's a Chrome extension that you can add on, you can see it in my own little screen. See, there's a little forest extension. Um, but you grow a forest. So you say, hey, I'm going to write for 25 minutes and then your tree will grow. But if you interrupt yourself during that time, your tree, your tree kills, you burn your tree down. <laughs> and so there's no like punishment, but you feel kind of sad because you killed your tree. And if you can only do five, 10 minutes, I think it's a bush. You grow a bush instead of a tree. But I love this concept of building a forest over um, times that you set. I also have this ad free, if you click this, I want you to, consider clicking the timer tab here because it's this beautiful clean interface and so i like to set okay i'm going to be super focused for these 25 minutes and um and it has you can see in the tab that's why they call it the tab timer so you actually can you don't have to have it open on your web browser but you can see kind of how much time you have left and then it rings some chimes when you're done which i think is really nice um i also use dayboard which just helps me if I open a new tab, it kind of reminds me of my five most important tasks. You write your own tasks and you can block websites. So for instance, this is by default, they block Facebook, they block Twitter. You can kind of set times. Okay, you can have 10 minutes on these sites before they're like, you know, hey, you need to refocus. So you can kind of set whatever 
websites you want blocked, it's free and it's a Chrome extension. And this is what happens is let's say you're too long on Twitter, even though you're there legitimately because you're doing research on like Twitter threads, you know, <laughs> Twitter may not be when you want to block, that's where you want to be. And all of a sudden you remind you're like, hey, you're not done for your work. And then it'll show you the thing that's at the top of your list. You're supposed to be preparing for your seminar talk for R795. <laughs> um, you know, I remind you, and you can say, oh, no, 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 I'm really done for the day. It's okay, I'm allowed to be here. So you can set it. I think one of the things that's really underused is just turning on the focus feature in Word because it makes everything on your computer like go away. So if you've never do that, you just go to view and go down to focus and it, you can still access all those tools. You just hover, it's sort of, and it'll drop down, but it's really like nice and clean and it helps you focus on writing. Um, I always say an extreme action uh, is- Tiffany, can we yeah. pause for a second? In the yeah. chat window, if, how many of you use the focus tool? Do any of you use the focus tool or have any of you heard of the focus tool? I'm just curious. Ben, okay. So two out of three not. So think about think about using it in the future. What about the timer? Was it a timer app? To, it's downloadable, Tiffany. Um, the which app? The um... timer. Does does it do any of you use a timer tool for your writing? Oh, Rachel. Okay. A different typer. No, never, never, no. So that, that's sort of like the Pomodoro method, like yeah. writing for, for 30 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever. That would help focus. The combination of this is to help get be productive and get something done, yeah. right? You know. Okay. Yeah. And so the um with the timer thing, it's just really say if you only have for if you work full time particularly. Um, saying I'm going to work for 10 minutes. I'm just, or I'm going to work for 25. Ideally, you should try to aim for 25 if you can. But if that seems like too long, bump it down until it seems feasible. And once you get going, then you usually get in a flow. So once you get started, then you're able to keep going. So, and you can use it for course assignments. It doesn't have to be for, di for dissertation related. It can, I mean, whatever you need to be working on, it's a good way to crank out a little bit every day. You know, so it's not saved towards. Um, when an assignment's due. Although, as Dr. Bonk mentioned, you guys are arriving early with <laughs> your assignments. Um, okay, I think my screen is paused. Should I resume share or do you want me to, are there any other questions? I don't have too many more slides, so don't worry. I'm not gonna keep talking. Yeah, why don't you finish the slides and we'll open up for questions after. Okay, sure. Yeah. So I, because I have an 11 year old and a seven year old, sometimes I have to take my kids to sports. My son should be at soccer. He's sick tonight. So, um, but when I'm there, I don't really have access to Wi Fi because I have an old plan. So I can't hotspot my phone. Mm. That's a great time to get writing done, honestly, sometimes when you don't have Wi Fi, because um, it sort of forces you to work with what you have, it's particularly with editing. Let's say your manuscripts already. I say that because I do go online and pull articles. I mean, it's hard. We're very connected. That's kind of um, you know, one way to think about it. And I would just say there's other strategies I've learned from Seedle that you can also gain from like just writing with pen and paper and don't stop writing, just get it out or striving for like, okay, I'm gonna hit 750 words. You know, maybe it's a word count instead of a time amount. you like, I'm gonna hit 250 or 500 words. Um, being creative, maybe you wanna dictate it on your phone. So it's just there or, using your support buddy that we've mentioned before in terms of i think this is my last there's yeah two two kind of content slides um i think this one that's underlined in an orange is really good is that it's very much okay to acknowledge you have more to do than the time that you have to do it in and that is normal and okay so it's not a shortcoming of you or a personal flaw so um I think that's 
a really good thing to remember. It's not a shortcoming. If you're like, I don't have time, like that's normal. So what we're going to do, I think, you know, I would just say recommit and say, lower your standards <laughs> to at least like say, Hey, what can I do? Can I get 10 minutes done? And then you can, one of the things National Center for Faculty Diversity Development promotes is having a plan for your semester. I used to do that as a doc student. I found it very helpful. So um, Tiffany, also, yeah. we're following along with you in our personal links, but your oh, slides shoot. aren't moving. So you might want to stop oh. sharing and reshare. Off the, <laughs> I there, did. there it goes. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I don't know what happened there. Thank you. You should have interrupted me sooner. Yeah, I was just saying this was just to acknowledge that you don't have as much time. And that's totally normal. Okay, so last last two slides. Just try to do positive associations, right? I love writing with friends. Friends to me are positive, and that's why I do the asynchronous writing log. I do writing groups um, synchronously online where we turn off our audio and screen and we work together. I think making writing with other people makes it fun for me, or even collaborating with other people on research makes it positive. So just think about what the positive association can be for you what gives you positive feelings. And I'm gonna end with a little bit of academic humor. Um, what actor is this? <laughs> <laughs> Rachel's mouthing something you put in the chat. Um, but yeah, you can think about, hey, and this is, you know, I kind of like analyses. So but if they go bad, it, it, it can come back to get you. That's definitely. <laughs> Can you go back two slides or yeah. one slide to there you go. This and, one? No, next one. Previous one here? Yeah. Uh, no, no. Uh, uh, back forward two. The finish? No, back three. <laughs> there. This one. You, you had it. Okay. The other no one. <laughs> go back the other way. <laughs> the one with the associations. How oh, the associations? Yeah. There you go. This one? Yeah, okay. Yeah. I thought oh, okay. I went. Oh, is this orange theory? I keep hearing about orange theory. You got treadmill and right. Oh, HGTV. treadmill and HGTV. So I run. What is that? I run. When I run, I watch HGTV on, on the treadmills. Because, you know, running, I have to, I tend to run inside, though I do like running outside. Um, so it just, I just like go to the gym and get it done. Um, Though Dr. Bonk always runs outside, right? Yeah, so you right. wouldn't associate running with HGTV yeah. at all. Yeah, I don't but know what HT. What is H? It's home. It's like the home and garden television channel. So it's oh. like makeovers of houses. It's such indulgent, just kind of one-off, <laughs> pleasurable viewing. Because someone has an ugly home and they finish with a beautiful home, or they're looking for a home, they find that happy home. It's always like a feel-good yeah show but yeah. it's so it's like, non-committal right you don't have to watch the next episode you don't need to see the episode before to follow along so it's just kind of i don't get to watch tv so it's sort of it's, like if i'm well, running you know i get a little indulgent so, okay so you're clearing your head doing this stuff yeah it's in, in like part. fun it's this associating running with like ooh, i get to watch an hgtv show oh okay yeah. well so, so, so i think what she's saying is associating writing with something that is fun or pleasurable, right. like oh. doing it socially, right. yeah. in the case of writing groups, or having an indulgent cup of Joe mm -hmm. with all the fixins, you know, having a special place that you go, a special time frame of mind, so that it's a positive thing and not something that you're dreading or that you feel right. is torturous. So, finding joy in the writing right. right so when i like do dishes i like to put on my favorite show or when um i have a really long commute i like listening to the radio you know what i mean like just associating something if you have a terrible commute susie used to drive three and a half hours to get to iu from the screaming child who i would feed cheerios to <laughs> i mean talk about ben, a champ ben is down in kentucky and he never comes up to visit me. So, you know, um, <laughs> right, Ben? Uh, <laughs> you will. Yeah, that's all, that is all my to-do list. I do love Bloomington. Okay, yeah. good, good, good. Um, so I just want to point out that we found out on Friday, we had HTGTV, we had um, 
Yua Ma's dissertation comps. We saw her kitchen and her wonderful woodwork in her house. <laughs> Beautiful place you have, Yua. <laughs> It is, we got it from the Facebook marketplace, <laughs> the kitchen set. Very nice. And I do enjoy watching HDT, HD, HGTV because I remember that's a show when I had my daughter, we just constantly use that as a background. Very relaxing. Very relaxing. Mm -hmm. And that's so for me. I want to make a couple comments comes to what you had to say. You, 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 Tiffany, you talked about hitting the ground running. And any of you are moving into faculty positions. Um, uh, it, you know, if you are, it's just you want to hit the ground running by having a couple um, um, articles set up for you. Maybe you don't submit them. <laughs> you wait until you get that first, you know, position and then you submit them. You know, you kind of have them set to go. Anyhow, you want to hit the ground running uh, in different way. Your advisor can help mm -hmm. you do that. So if you're you're looking to get a faculty position, there are ways that you can structure things and you know, um, label them and uh, submit them and so forth and revise them. And the other thing I want to mention is, you know, Tiffany's got Atlanta Braves and Susie's got the Astros and I'm, I got the Brewers that didn't get in the playoffs this year. They missed out by one game to Philadelphia. Um, but anyway, so questions for Tiffany before we go to Susie. Anyone have a, a question or a comment for, for, for her? Yeah, and I hope it wasn't too long. But do do come back to your writing accountability group because it's fun and you don't have to be there at the same time. So. If there aren't burning questions, I wouldn't mind jumping into the few slides that I have. I, do, I am teaching a class at um, oh. 730 Eastern yeah. time. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I will need to jump off a little before so I can start that. If yeah, that's let's... OK. Yeah, yeah, let's do that, but make sure let's one, does anyone have one pressing thing before Susie's going to jump in? I want to make sure that you don't have anything pressing. And if you are having difficulties, you're, some people are having internet bandwidth issues and so forth, feel free to use the chat. We can work off the chat window with all of you. You don't, you know, um, I know my, I think my internet's been acting up on and off today. So with that, so Susie, is a special education person who got doctorate in IST here uh, with Dr. Tom Brush as her advisor. Uh, Tiffany, who is your advisor? Elizabeth Bowling. Elizabeth Bowling, okay. So to the star faculty in the IST um, department, soon to be a different name because of learning sciences merging with us, we'll have the IST program the adult ed program and the learning science program, and maybe will be called learning design and technology and lifelong learning. That's one of the options. We're not sure yet. Um, we're voting this Friday on, mm. on the name. So we're in the midst of that um, taking place here. So yes, that is huge. Um, yeah. So if you have names, I think we should be kind. Knowledge, instruction, networking, and design. So then we can get t-shirts, say the kind department, kind people, mm -hmm. coffee mugs. No one's going to like my idea. I'm sure of that. Um, either kind or happy I wanted us to be. Because the, really, in reality, when I joined IST, it was a very, like, like language ed, people are fighting tooth and nail about everything. Because that was a changeover from the behaviorist time to constructivist times. And they, were, they all hated each other. You know, It was not a kind department. <laughs> um, and so, and neither was language education. <laughs> Ed Psych, where I was, was, however, it, it was very quiet and there, every, everyone got along with everyone else until we got three people from IST that moved to our department to move to Ed Psych. <laughs> and then it was a problem because they wanted us to change their name to something with learning sciences in it. And they kicked me out. And um, there's a long story here. Anyways, that's why I think we should be kind. So, uh, Susie, I'll pa pass it on <laughs> to you, Susie. That sounds great. So, um, I'm Susie Gronseth, and I'm clinical associate professor in learning design and technology, used to be called instructional technology program area within the Department of Curriculum Instruction at the University of Houston, located in the College of Education at the University of Houston main campus. We have four universities within the system. So we are University of Houston, the flagship university. 
And then there are three others that are part of the system. I've been there for, this is the 11th year. I uh, just got my 10 year um, bookshelf uh, award thing uh, at the beginning of the semester. Round of applause. <laughs> and and it's she interesting also has a looking book back on over UDL, that decade. By the way. <laughs> so it's Susie, gone by fast in some regards and in some ways um, there's been a lot of experiences. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have a eight year old now, so he was born during that time frame. Um, I, I'm going up for full clinical this year and, uh, I could have gone up last year, but I was kind of wondering if I wanted to move into a tenure track position, but I, um, was approached about running for faculty Senate president, uh, in the spring. I had been serving on faculty Senate and the executive committee the last few years, and really the ranks had flattened during COVID. I was having um, multiple converse conversations with senior administration in March and continuing and how to make decisions about what we were gonna do moving forward. Um, and so I've just kind of learned a lot of the institutional knowledge in the fast lane through that experience. And um, the faculty, thought that I was ready to take the reins as, as the next uh, president. So they elected me as, as president and I'll serve next year in that position. I'm in president elect this year and I'll be the first non-tenure track faculty member at the University of Houston main campus um, to be faculty Senate president. And um, that's not the first within Texas because I've met with the other faculty senate presidents, president-elects, past presidents in, in the state at a conference last month. And there are some others that are that are non-tenure track. But for the University of Houston, this is a new space. Um, and so it's it's been interesting and I think it'll it'll continue to be a, a learning curve. Um, it's difficult in some respects that I have to cut my teeth kind of in front of everybody. Um, but I feel like I'm I'm gonna be a lot more knowledgeable at the end of all of this, and hopefully we'll all be better for it. But so really, my role is to represent the faculty, so it's not about my own agenda. And so I'm understanding as much as I can about what the experiences and the needs and the challenges and the concerns and the issues are for all faculty um, on the main campus and um, trying to prioritize those and to participate in shared governance with senior administration to make sound decisions that work for our community. So Susie, I'll say three things. One, you're the University of Houston president or chancellor's wonderful person and, mm -hmm. and is very supportive of you. And um, it, you know she, she's just tremendous. The so second, Susie has a book on universal design for learning. If anyone's interested in UDL, buy her book with Rutledge. It came out a couple of years back as I edited a book with how many? 48, 50, 60 chapters? 47 chapters, 47. 85 authors. Yep, yep. And third, Tiffany and Susie and I have done a workshops or sessions for AACT on writing space. And Susie took the lead on those very creatively. And we've had some fun with it at AACT and other places. So we've presented on writing space. I assume you're going to show us your writing space as part of this, or maybe just- Yes, I'll show the, the slides from that workshop um, that I had presented, and I'll go ahead and choose that uh, screen yeah. right now. Thank you. Um, about the writing space. And we talk about a physical writing space, but we're also talking about <clears throat> um, some of the less physical aspects, which Tiffany um, went into- so practically, which I appreciate, um, creating time, space in our schedule, creating um, space in our brains to process the different parts of writing, creating, you know, emotional space. I, um, since I did this presentation, I've been teaching a course to our EDD students in health science education uh, within our program area. And I use two books in that class, and one of them talks about writing space, and it's Helen Sword's Air and Light and Time and Space. Um, the subtitle is How Successful Academics Write. 
And we've gone through this book. I've taught the course two times. Uh, we go through this book chapter by chapter. It's divided into uh, four parts because you can take a um, assessment about um, kind of your base, she calls it, behavioral habits, artisanal habits, social habits, and emotional habits. It spells that acronym B-A-S-E. And the, the writing space um, is part of the behavioral habits. She has a chapter on the power of place, which resonates a lot with me, but there's a lot of other um, good ideas in the other sections as well. And really she's taken um, voices. It's, it's a lot of excerpts from interviews and surveys um, and, and vignettes um, from different people in a variety of discipline areas about their experiences in writing. So that's that's one that that we use that's related to um, writing space. And uh, I'll wait to show you the second one here in a little bit. So this was the workshop Concentration Cafes, Coffee and Collaboration, trying to do a little alliteration with the C's discussion of the craft of supportive spaces for academic writing. And just to kind of bring in that it takes all of these different dimensions to ultimately oftentimes get that final piece. You know, where is it going to happen? How are you going to make it make it happen? Um, this is a picture of uh, one of my offices. I actually have two offices now. I have a much better looking office uh, through our um, UH Population Health that has a window, but this one doesn't. And so it's quite cluttered with a lot of uh, wall hangings. And I share it with a colleague, a clinical faculty in my college have to share offices. So it's not the greatest space for writing, to be honest. Um, I have been using my other office and I don't have a picture of it, but it's it's nice to look out over the bayou. It's a, I can close the door, it's quiet. Um, this one has partial walls that go up that you can kind of see it on the left side. The walls don't go all the way to the ceiling because the air has to circulate. It was a lab that was divided into offices. But that's my campus office. So I really need other places to write and get it done. Also, when I'm in my campus office, a lot of people are coming by and interrupting what I'm doing, which is great for starting new projects, but not really great for finishing them. So um, during COVID, we had to quarantine here at the house. We've had COVID a few times, but then also there was quarantines here in Houston. And I did actually get quite a bit of writing done, as did my colleagues. It's been interesting to see the productivity over the last couple of years when people were not having to do the commute into campus, um, but and things were canceled. Uh, but this is my space here at home. I'm actually sitting at this desk right now. That's my now eight-year-old sitting on my lap. That's, the, that's often something that happens. I heard him at the door not too long ago. He does like to be right in my space. So sometimes I have to try to write uh, around him. Um, but I do use multiple screens. I've got the screen on the other side right now, but I do use multiple screens. That's the way that I can put some of the content in one screen, some in another. Actually, I have three screens in my population health office, so I'll be even more productive. But I, I really find that that's uh, essential for me because I do um, have my working document, but then I have a lot of other things that are just put there for my reference. And it's a lot faster for me to have them on another screen than to have them on tabs that I have to click. Oh, another thing I want you to notice is I have my cup of coffee there. That is a treat for me. So I'll have my cup of coffee, I'll write in the morning and I'll have that and I'll write during the time that I have drinking the coffee. And um, so it just, it does make it pleasurable. I do some writing on paper, as you can see my scratch paper, I keep that here on the desk. That's usually for processing and not necessarily um, turning into text. But I'll take advantage of where I am because I do have to be on campus for, for a lot of things. Um, I travel. Um, and, and a lot of times when I travel, writing is something that I can do when I'm waiting for the plane, when I'm in the plane, when, you know, those kinds of things, as long as I'm not traveling with my family. If I'm traveling alone, that's a good time to write. Um, but being outside is great. Or when I'm on a bus, and I was in uh, Tanzania a few years ago, I was trying to 
uh, work on an article for the Journal of Applied Instructional Design that is, is now out. This was the one um, on an instructional design strategy for um, health science education. Um, and I worked on it on the bus while we were making the journey up the mountain to where we were gonna be for that week. So it's possible. I was not connected to the internet. That was definitely offline. This is a place that I like to go when I'm feeling like a mental block, um, when I need to brainstorm, when I wanna feel, uh, I'm just like writing the same things over and over again and I need some new ideas. I need something fresh. I'll go to this particular location, which is um, not too far from the house. Sometimes I'll walk there and that'll get the blood flowing. It'll kind of prime my brain for what's going, what I'm going to do there. Um, and there's a, a bench there. I bring a, a sparkling water, got my, my laptop. Sometimes I'll turn on my hotspot and sometimes I won't. Just depends on what I want to accomplish there and I'll write. And, uh, and the thing is, it's kind of like a timer because I'll write for as long as I have power on the laptop. And then when the power is gone, then I pack up and I go home. And so it's not this in, indefinite amount of writing, which it felt like what I was doing today was I was writing and writing and writing, trying to, trying to finish this manuscript. I have a defined amount of time. I do it. I move on. Um, but I usually do that for the specific task of brainstorming, innovating, coming up with something new, ideating. That's that's that space for me. It's not really the space for editing, refining, um, building in literature and so on. So I kind of have different spaces for where I feel I'm most effective when I'm writing. No matter where I am, I do find that it's helpful to appreciate some beauty around. Um, finding beautiful design, uh, whether it's in my messy offices or here in this uh, workroom or outside, just kind of looking, taking it in, or even in a coffee shop, you know, appreciating what's happening um, around the beautiful people, the decor, the, um, if I can just trying to listen to how many sounds I can hear before I put my headphones in. So just taking a moment to find that beautiful design that then might influence the, the writing that I am about to produce. I'm trying, and this is, this is a work in progress, trying to self-advocate for writing space and then producing. So when I first created this slide, I was negotiating with my department chair to have scholarship allocation within my workload. I was 80-20 at the time. I had asked our previous department chair and, and she had said no, um, but we got a new department chair and I said, you know, I, I really need to create space. But before I had that conversation with her, I already had some things in process. I had grant, small grants that were um, under review. I had some articles that were start. I had one that I had um, already published in an open source journal the previous year. Um, you know, I was starting to, to be able to situate myself for producing, but then I wanted to produce. And I don't quite know what is comparable to 10% of my time or 20% of my time. We don't have it that defined within our um, annual review documentation, particularly for non-tenure track because scholarship research, the section is not even in our policy. But I try to do some, some sufficient amount of things um, to you know, show for that, that amount of time, research expenditures, publications, presentations, and so on. So I have been able to negotiate a course uh, allocation each semester for scholarship. And some of my um, external funding now pays for that, um, if not all of it. Uh, so, so it, but, but to get started, I had to continue to bring it up and and it took it took a, a a couple of times but now I'm trying to you know make them happy for for taking that chance on me to do that I also felt like it was important because um it's taking away time from my teaching it's taking away time from administration tasks so it really should be built into the workload if that's something that I'm doing that is 
going to benefit our, our program area, our university. Um, building networks for collaboration and writing opportunities. So this, this has become a lot easier the longer I've been in the field. I get requests for collaborating quite often, and I'm starting to have to be more selective about that. Um, it's it, it's been difficult, or I'm trying to say something like, I'll be third author and I'll do editing, but you go ahead and create the draft of the concept. I'll fully support that. And here's a reason why I'm not going to, you know, have a higher role. That's, that's again, a work in progress. It's somewhat uh, working. Sometimes the people I'm collaborating with are um, more experienced. And so they do run with that. And it's, it's a, a great draft that then I just, you know, edit. Sometimes it needs a lot more work in order for me to feel comfortable having my name on it. And so it's, it's a larger commitment than I, one I really wanted to make. But building that collaboration um, can uh, really make you more productive if you have um, if the collaborations are positive. And so there might be a lot of reasons why you choose to collaborate with different people, but do be purposeful about it. That would be my recommendation. Don't just always say yes to every, every ask. And then get more mileage for an effort. So this is something that um, Dr. Bonk has really taught us, I think, than um, anyone else. And that is when, um, for example, he saw my CV and he saw all the presentations that I was doing. And he said, well, something's wrong with this. Why are you doing so many presentations and not turning them into publications? You do a presentation, it's all well and good, but then it's gone. You do a publication, you're able to have it as a course reading, share it with other people who want to learn about the topic, you know, use it as a um, a, a pre-reading for even another presentation incorporated into materials. It can, it can go so much farther. So I've been trying to think about how I can get more mileage for each thing I do. So when I write, when I'm on, for example, this, uh, one of my grants, I'm thinking about, okay, I'm doing the evaluation reporting for it. What kinds of articles will this look like? Actually, that happens even in the in the grant proposal stage. I'm thinking about, you know, what kinds of publications are going to come out of this? I can do a piece about the evaluation design. I can do a piece about the first round of uh, evaluation feedback. I can do one, you know, about this. And, and, and sometimes we have to go ahead and do IRB too. So it all kind of works hand in hand. But thinking about getting that, that mileage from the effort, um, turning a conference presentation into a paper, doing the paper first and doing a conference presentation after. It doesn't always have to be where I do the presentation and then I need to expand it into this piece, um, but just trying to do multiple, multiple uh, formats, not self-plagiarizing, but multiple formats. They may be for different audiences too. If it's a really good idea, it really should have you know, multiple applications. Some of the writing tools that we use for the book, I just wanted to kind of show you how um, Dr. Elizabeth Dalton and I organized that because we did this all cloud-based. We um, a priori identified eight sections. So we were organized in how the structure of the book was gonna come to be. And we, we actually spent some time writing out what we um, envisioned would go in those sections at a high level. Um, and sent that to the authors. It was part of the author call. And then we worked to put the manuscripts within the sections and facilitate peer review within our um, uh, manuscripts. And we stored everything in Google Drive. And so we just created links to kind of keep everything organized. We created a document that was our tracking sheet. I find creating documents like this with tables or using a spreadsheet in um, Excel or another kind of spreadsheet tool, in addition to the document that we're writing on, is oftentimes really helpful to organizing all the things that go into the publications. You can see I have a series of folders on the right with all the authors. I have a folder structure um, in Office 365 that allows me to get things pretty quickly. And I think about how I want to name the folder. Sometimes I rename them if I feel like 
I keep going to another folder and just something else makes sense because that's that's just really important. I know you can use a search feature, um, but for me, like an organized uh, folder structure really works. I have started since we did this presentation, having writing space in my calendar on Tuesday and Thursday mornings between eight and 10 o'clock. I've blocked it out. And the reason I did that is because I have a lot of meetings with um, the faculty senate that get put on my calendar and I needed to ensure that I had writing space. I just couldn't leave it up in the air anymore. So I do have at least those four hours every week blocked out where meetings shouldn't get put on my calendar. Now, some people do get to put meetings <laughs> even, <laughs> even where I have it blocked off and I just have to try to adjust and um, that's just the way it is. But most of the time, most of the meetings I have been able to keep that. So I did use that writing space this morning, but then I had to extend it. Um, I wrote before that I actually started around 630 and then I um, had a few meetings midday and then I wrote um, before we had to join for this class to get that manuscript I was working on done. So it was about six hours today, but it was I was at the point where I needed to finish it. And it wasn't just, you know, working a little bit at a time on it. We were, I was at that stage where I wanted to get it done and get it off to the, um, the third author who's going to do a review and then it'll go to the journal. Um, the second thing is uh, where, where those writing opportunities might come. I know AECT has a lot of communications about special issues and calls such as that that inspire um, writing or where you think I've had this project, I need to put it in something, this will be a way that can structure that because it'll have deadlines for when you need to put the proposal in, how many words, what the um, what the focus is. I found, for example, um, a recent publication that came out in distance education was on systems thinking and adding that systems lens to this uh, collaboration uh, UDL uh, model that I had developed a few years ago was the final piece that I needed to get this thing published. It made that article so much better because I had submitted it and it had gotten rejected and then it sat on my shelf for a few years. There, there was this special issue call. I took a look at a lot of the systems literature that I hadn't looked at really since I'd been in grad school and I said, this makes so much sense for this model and explaining this model. To, to the audience. So that, that piece got published earlier this year, and I'm really grateful for um, the editors doing that special issue. You can say yes to things, and you need to say no to other things in order to retain space for writing. Otherwise, it'll get eaten up with all the other things. At least been, that's been my experience. I do write with students. I try to incorporate it into my teaching, incorporate it into the classes. I'm teaching an instructional evaluation course. That's who I'm going to meet with in about 13 minutes. And they're working on innovations articles there. If you look at the health science education literature, the medical ed education literature, you'll see innovations are these shorter pieces. They could be 500 words. They could be 1,200 words. Um, the longest is about 2,200 words. That's a 12 tips format in medical teacher. But their innovations, they are talking about things that they're doing in their teaching practices or ideas. Some of them have a limited number of uh, references. And so they're writing those, those as part of the class and I'm working with them in the class. I've done this six times and um, some of the articles have been published. Um, so that's been pretty cool. And uh, so, yeah, I try to incorporate writing into my teaching because teaching is, is really the the large bulk of, of my workload. Um, these are some of the people that I've collaborated with over the years, just a fraction, really. I don't even have Dr. Oh yeah, I do have Elizabeth Dalton in, um, we're on the beach in the lower left. Um, but just a lot of different collaborations. You can see uh, Dr. Bonk there in the lower right with Erwin Handoko. We have an article in IRODL out of, off of Erwin's uh, dissertation. And taking the time to celebrate is really important. So celebrating, you know, not just the the um, the 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 day the the publication comes out, but celebrating, you know, each step along the way. 
Um, we submitted on the left side, uh, Juanita Hebert, who uh, was a master's student, then an adjunct instructor for us, and now is an EDD student at Sam Houston State. We submitted uh, the article for an award and we got uh, second place on the award and, and she came to AACT to accept it. And so, you know, that was kind of cool. That takes some time to celebrate um, and see where that that writing would take us. On the right is the cover of our book. And I was able to give a copy of it to my parents and put a little inscription in that. And that really meant a lot to me to say, you know, here's here's the product of, of a lot of investment that you've had in, in me. I have my first uh, edited book that's come out in print. But it always feels really great to finish a manuscript. I feel pretty good right now <laughs> after having been somewhat finished. I think it's like 90% there uh, today. It, it was a big hurdle. So I'll stop sharing. I've got a few minutes to, to take um, questions and conversation, then I'll have to hop off. Muted. So any questions or comments? I didn't really have any questions about the the writing uh, tips. Um, but can I ask a question about UDL? Sure. So I've been working on a lot of DEIA stuff for my job, and I wondered if someone asked you, so I'm asking you, um, how does UDL connect to DEIA? So this is something that CAST is looking at right now. Uh, it, I, I believe the way that the conversations have been around incorporation of racial equity in the guidelines uh, in the UDL 3.0. Um, and it just, it doesn't have to be just racial, but I think that there's, there's a lot, um, to unpack in, in just that realm. Um, but they, they do look at a, a number of different areas where, um, discrimination and inequities persist. I think that there is a lot of, uh, connection there. I think they come from different traditions. You know, UDL was an ability framework that arose out of a high resourced part of the United States and has since been um, adopted, transposed, incorporated into the fabrics of a variety of different contexts. And so they change, they change some components about that. And I encourage people to retain components that feel like they fit within the philosophy and the resources and um, the priorities of, of their context. And, um, you know, don't worry about everything else. It doesn't have to be a checklist where you have to do all of the checkpoints. So I feel like there's a lot of overlap. I'm exploring more of um, indigenous education and how UDL, um, UDL ideas um, coincide with that. That's one of the pieces that is in the in process right now with a couple of colleagues uh, up in um, Northeast um, that are native um, educators. So trying to take their voice and understand how I hear that in the UDL conversations and making the bridges between the two. Um, so that, that's a long answer to say that I think that there's potential. Some people have started to articulate it with like culturally responsive teaching and UDL, those kinds of articles. There's been a few. Um, but I think there's still a lot of work that will be done. And it'll be interesting to see when the third version of the UDL guidelines come out, how prescriptive they get um, in that area. So Susie, you helped me with an article last week or last month, maybe with 15 guidelines for self-learning. It was self about a month learning. ago, I think. Yeah. yeah. And we're trying to link those 15 guidelines to UDL. And as you may have, as Scott said, that, that article came out uh, with Mana Ju with 15, uh, those 15 recs in Open Learning Journal. Well, yesterday, the sister article to that was accepted in a special issue for a journal 
um, that's a sage journal from um, from East China. Normally, uh, it's called On the Trail of Self-Directed Learners. My point is, both those papers aren't original data. They're summaries of our data. So sometimes you can write a piece that kind of is an overview uh, of your of your journey in the field or of several articles that you've published. It's interesting to provide those macro level overviews of the field. It's much more interesting writing to me anyhow. It's much more shareable with your friends and family and colleagues because it's they're not reading the the in the trenches types of research. They might not understand what structural equation modeling is or you know uh, sequential whatever mixed methods design, but they they will understand um, guidelines that you're providing to help people learn better. And so that was kind of fun. I also had one this week that's going to the medical journal that's 3,200 words, I think. And uh, they had a limit of 3,000. So my co-author, she's so mad. She goes, we got to cut 200 words. Just cut the 200 darn words out and send it back in. They'll publish it, you know. Uh, well, be glad that, that, you know, that so it, it's on tech variety for the medical field. So um, so the tech variety model. So I've had a couple of things that hit lately. And I, it goes in streaks. Anything for, for Susie? I did say I was going to share the second book that oh, yeah. we use and then I'll need to hop yeah. off. Um, yeah. This is the second book that I use in that academic writing course uh, for our doctoral students. It's called Academic Writing. For graduate students, Essential Tasks and Skills by Swales and Feek. And this is the third edition. Um, it, it really breaks down uh, the structure of writing going from general to specific, that structure, which can be really useful. Um, here's an uh, illustration of it. Uh, where you start with a general statement, elaboration on the statement, more detailed elaboration, and then go to broader statements. So you actually start big, you narrow, 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 and this is how it's applicable to the field, right? So that's a structure that you'll notice is in a lot of uh, academic writing that we'll, we'll read in our doctoral programs. I don't read in other languages, so I don't know the traditions in um other journals that aren't in English, but or right. even um, book publications. But that's wow. a that's a structure that I think really makes sense um, in the dissertation chapters too. Uh, but it has stuff like that. It has some stuff about grammar, um, some exercises throughout, and uh, it's been a really uh, interesting book. We don't read it cover to cover. I just kind of hop around and we work through each portion. Um, but that's one that uh, our writing center uh, recommended. And uh, what's and the publisher? Read. Who's the publisher? Soon we can look it up and uh, share this it with one us. is published by University of Michigan Press. Okay. And again, the title is This is called Academic uh, Writing for Graduate Students by Swales and Feet. You could probably get one of their previous editions and be fine. Yeah, so I'll try and include it next semester. Let's give Susie a round of applause of thanks. A round of applause for all the awards and everything that she's gotten and the paper that she got finished today. So you need to head to class, my friend. Yes, so. I do. I saw somebody already started the session. We use Teams, so. <laughs> yeah, and this is the other book, Air and Light and Time and Space by Helen Sword. I highly recommend that. It's a so good book. Bo both your slides, if you could send me the link again so I can, I'll upload uh, I know I have the sure link thing. somewhere, um, but then I'll upload to Dropbox for this class. So thank all you. Right. All. Thank you, Susie. Thank you. Tiff Bye Tiffany, you hang around for one minute. Uh, so, um, Tiff Does anyone have a co final comment or question for Tiffany before she has to run? Just keep going. I just want to encourage all of you. I know it's... Um, it's tough. And as you get closer to the end, which I know because you're feeling done, <laughs> you feel like, oh, I've done all the coursework, I've done my comps, you know, and, and people keep asking, so aren't you, you know, where are you at? And they don't fully understand the 25 steps that you go through to get finish, 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 finish. So, um, well, we started class with Shannon and Megan. Uh, why don't we, um, before we go to break, Shannon or Megan, you want to make a comment? 
Um, for me, this is just a lot to take in. I'm not much of a writer and seeing these grids and everything that everyone does for writing time, it's just a whole lot of wow uh, for me. So it's like, what, what have I, I, I'm at the point, even though I'm done with the, the coursework, it's like, what have I gotten myself into? Uh, <laughs> that, that's kind of where I'm feeling right now. Right. So I don't really have any questions because I wouldn't even know where to begin. Yeah. Megan? Hi. No, I don't have any question. I just um, have, I just, it's interesting because I've never ever organized writing in that way. So it, it's good to see, you know, especially you know, I've written for a long time, I have a bunch of series at this point. And, so, you know, I'm used to that kind of writing, but yes, coming up to the dissertation, which is, it, it's good to see some of the resources that have. Yeah, I think the reason I wanted to share it when you're coming up to the writing phase is that that is your coursework, is your dissertation, right? That's all you're doing. And so if you don't know how to structure it, you ha I mean, because it's really you, I would, Dr. Bowling, if you've had class with her in any of your other courses, um, you know, she described the dissertation journey as really it's, it, they're, the faculty are there to support you, but it's really you doing the work to get to the end, right? And, um, and the faculty, I think being on the other side of it now, right, I understanding what the faculty are pulled into in so many ways and all the other students that they're supporting so remember like every faculty member does care about you immensely and if you're like oh but i only get to see them you know like 45 minutes maybe once every three weeks or something um being prepared and coming to those meetings with here's where i have questions or here's what i've done since i've last met so when i meet with my students i give them like give them feedback and say okay well, when you come back i need you to tackle this right so that we're constantly moving forward together um but really how fast or how slow you progress is kind of on you and that's why i think some of these tips are meant to be keeping you moving forward knowing that you're the person moving yourself forward um, and the faculty are here to guide you and give you feedback and help you refine ideas um i don't know and like dr bonk said you know when there's sometimes if you have data already there that's fantastic. Um, it's not always the case. Susie had it. It's one of the reasons why she was able to finish as fast as she did. She smartly used a, a large national data set that already existed, right? So uh, I, I did not do that <laughs> in hindsight. But now I'm, I'm more, I'm more, I'm now more aware of here's a situation where there's data already been collected and I can support in the analysis process, you know, and so we're you just also I tell my doc students the edu students are, this is an exercise showing for shannon you're mentioning like i don't know where to begin kind of thing um the dissertation is evidence that you can carry out research on your own with rigor that you can be able to understand the literature and identify where there needs to be attention you know where practice can advance uh, carrying out a study that shows that you can address that research question write up findings, present them in in a in a way that meets the criteria of the department, right? So I think it's just sort of like, can you do the research, right? That's really what this is an exercise. It doesn't have to be end all be all research of of humanity, right? It's it's just the first step of like, yes, I can do this. You know, I would say my son is 11, he can cook a meal. He can make eggs, scrambled eggs, mac and cheese, very good with cereal. <laughs> He hasn't, you know, I think progressing is making the meals. We want to get to the point where he can make a good meal, but you know, we're just seeing, can you make, can you make the academic meal that is a research study um, independently, which is hard, right? It's hard, but it's doable, but you just got to be diligent and I'll stop there. Dr. Yeah. Bob. So the 45 minutes every month, I mean, I didn't have that. I don't think I met with my advisor 45 minutes in six months, but right. I did call him at two in the morning when I got near the end to ask him about Ancovas and how to run them, along with the person who's helped me doing the statistics. And he still reminds me to this day, three decades plus later, of me, not my advisor, my friend, uh, who's now a professor at Arizona State, 
reminds me of how I called him at 2 a.m. for a week straight. I was panicking. So we're all panicking at the end. I had a son coming from Korea. I was applying for jobs. I was selling a house. I was getting new new place to live and, you know, analyzing data all at once. And um, my, my stress level was maxed out. I saw 15 doctors my last two months and they gave me 15 different medicines to take care of the bursitis that happened. I mean, just, you know, all the so fine ways to de-stress. For me, it was swimming a mile a day. You yeah, know? I run. Yeah. But, and he runs, you run now. I run now. Yeah, I always ran. Yeah, but. Right. I, and I would just say when I meant about meeting with the dissertation advisor, when you're nearing the end, right, when you're in the like preparing yeah. for the defense, that's mm -hmm. when you may have more meetings as yeah. they're going through. Right. So it just depends too. And yeah. sometimes it's good just, you know, you need to know who your advisors, you can ask them, what is your approach or what is your strategy? And if they haven't yet told you, because they'll tell you, hey, this is how I do it. So when I mentioned that, Dr. Bong is how Dr. Bull or Professor Bowling, that was at, at that time. Yeah. Was, and so I'm treating this, as I've said in the past, as three courses in one. You're learning about research methodology from a couple of different people, like Dr. Hitchcock was in here. Uh, once and Florence Martin talking about systematic reviews of the research and so forth. In part, this is a course to prepare you for your dissertation, a proposal writing, a proposal course, and uh, prepare you for quals for those who are EAD students. So it's really four courses in one. And fourth or third is to get you thinking about writing and be a better writer. And um, not all of you will be, you know, doing research after your dissertation and worry about publishing and so forth. But I want to give you the, the suggestions and tips that I have, that Susie has, that Tiffany has, so that you can learn from all of us and what we've succeeded in doing, as well as our, our we're all rejected, you know, all the time. We're, but we pinch our skin and, it, you know, it's, it feels the same as when we're accepted, when the articles accept, doesn't feel any different. We're the same person, you know, um, when we get a, a reject letter as we were when we had three things published in one week, you know, and. So you got to get over the one thing you got to keep an even keel. You got to get over the highs. You can't get too high and you can't get too low, you know, and you just you talk to others about the reject letters that you might have gotten and how you, you just address them. So when we come back from break, I'll talk a little bit about that. But if you just address all the advisor points that or your committee members points or all the reviewers points the, to the best that you can, that's all you can ask for. I mean, you can't you can't do anything more than that, um, but you want to provide a tone, uh, understanding tone uh, that you know you are you are agreeing to their points. You're thankful for their points. You just want to start with I thank you, right, Tiffany? I thank you for pointing this out. I didn't think about that before, or you know whatever, and 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 that will get you to lower their expect kind of lower their standards a little bit because they won't push you so hard if you're thankful and genuine and honest with them and you work with them and you compromise and you're flexible. You do all that. You sometimes they'll give in along the way, and you only maybe have to make eighty percent of the suggested changes because that's good enough. You know, if you're a good human being, they'll be a good human being too. And uh, you know, w Tiffy, would you agree with that? Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, remember your advisors, they want to see you succeed. Right. They want to help you. They genuinely want you to graduate, mm. right? So if they're giving feedback, it's because it's coming from a place of they know what needs you have to do to get to that level of what's expected. So come at with like, you know, tell yourself they want me to succeed. They want me, you know, they want me to succeed because I know it's hard. <laughs> I had my doctoral student share this vision of how the plates of the earth are going to change in 250, like, I don't know how many years it was. Million just years. years. Million years. Yeah. And he, he put, and he said, and I will still be working on my dissertation. <laughs> Hashtag like never finished. And I laughed. And then I was like, oh no, does he feel like, I'm the person that's preventing him because I, you know, I, he needs more feet. He needs, he, it doesn't come as easily for him as it does for right. some of my other advising. Right, so I right. give him more suggestions and help, but it's meant to help him, not delay him. <laughs> I'm like, oh my goodness. Yeah, 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 <laughs> I, I know. I understand that too. I had one who finished last year, it took 20 years, but he wasn't mine originally and he did get done. You just got to keep going. He finished, He's at least he didn't give up, right? Some people are just like, I'm done. So he started before you arrived and finished. I know, that's crazy. That's yeah. saying something. Yeah. And he met his, 
wife in IST lab and has two teenage kids who weren't, you know, even born when he started in the program. So, you know. Yeah, I had yeah. two kids during my program. I had my mom pass away at a very young age. Like my dad was had cancer. I mean, there was a lot of stuff. I had a house fire. I had a, a pipes burst. Like my house was destroyed twice. It was a lot. It was a lot. Yeah. And yeah. it was, but I made it. It's just, I wasn't the, I didn't, it wasn't the fast path. So fear well, slow. given all that, let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> Tiffany, thanks for hanging yeah. with us tonight for the, sure. for the hour and a half with yeah. us and a little over. Uh, big on applause. the free range children. My husband did come home about an hour ago. So, oh, they um, fully unsupervised. so I am going to stop the recording of week 12, part one at